Wonderful. You know, I think it's such a beautiful song to begin our Christmas season and to hear kind of the magic and the glory of Christmas so beautifully sung to us. And you might notice that we have prepared for Christmas, which feels always to me a little bit fast right after Thanksgiving. I mean, I just ate turkey, didn't you? We just ate turkey, and the next thing we know, we've got Christmas trees, big and little, and we've got decorations that have begun in our church. And I have to tell you, it was so much fun being here yesterday. There was a whole crew working on getting some things together inside the church, and there was a crew working outside, cleaning up the fall so that we can prepare for winter. And all of it reminds me that Christmas, the spirit of Christmas, has begun. And so, you know, Christmas is not only all of the festivities, though. It's not only the wonderful family times together and all the customs and traditions that we know. It is a time when we join with other Christians in the world. And believe me, we're not alone there are almost 3.5 billion Christians in the world. And so a third of the people that profess to be religious say that they are Christian. And they, along with us, join together to celebrate the birth of Jesus, um, who existed 2,000 years ago and only had a three-year ministry. Now, I think that's pretty profound. I mean, you can take any three years in my life, and I guarantee you nobody will be talking about it 2,000 years later. Nobody. Nobody. But it is because of who Jesus was. It is because he developed that Christ nature, the divine nature within him, that today, just like then, we still, we bow in gratitude to all that he has been through his example. And so it's a wonderful thing. And, and I, as a minister, always look forward to the retelling of the Christmas story, which happens every year. How many of you feel that way, that you look forward to the Christmas story every year? So a, a, I was going to say a good chunk of you, but that's not exactly right. So how, <laughs> how many of you go, oh, this again? How many of you do that? So be honest, really, nothing bad will happen if you're honest. Nothing bad will happen. Well, I have news for you. Try being a minister, okay? <laughs> Try being a minister. <laughs> It's so true. You know, I have to tell you, Andy Dale, who is our sound guy, was putting on my mic, and he said to me, he kind of had a quote-unquote come-to-Jesus moment with me, and he said, so you can be honest. Tell me, do you ever get, like, how do you really feel about Jesus? No, he didn't say that. He said, how do you really feel about Christmas? And I said, I love it. And he kind of said, really? You love it? I mean, <laughs> isn't it like a lot of work and don't ministers get tired of it? Yes, it's a lot of work. But if we all hold within our hearts with fresh eyes, if we hold an open heart, and if we look at the Christmas story as our story, as our opportunity to transform, to be more than we've ever been. And believe me, that's a lot, isn't it? For us to be more of the Christ than we've ever been. And if we hold that to be truly possible within us, then the Christmas story comes alive in us. And that's what I look forward to every year at Christmas time. And I hope that you hold that in your heart as well. Now, the Christmas story itself, as you know, is the story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. It really didn't happen on December 25th, but why get caught up in details? Not important. What's really important is that Jesus was born, and he was born 
destined with a greatness, knowing that he was going to transform the world. It was an expectation of the people around him. And so they held him in that light. And everyone, everyone in the Jesus story was somehow touched by either the power of who he was to be or they were touched by the magnificence of God to see and be more. So think about it. When we look to Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, we find in our hearts great inspiration by the faith that they chose and their love of God that was exemplary. And then, and then when we look to the shepherds, we are humbled by their commonness and their humility and yet the willingness to open to something far greater than what they knew in their ordinary lives. And when we think about, when we think about the wise men, we see individuals coming from all different parts of the world to honor the presence of a Messiah, a great being that was going to transform lives. So to be able to honor that wisdom is something that is incredibly powerful. And of course, what would the Christmas story be without angels? The angels that come to Mary and to Joseph and to the shepherds, they are indeed the messengers of God. They are the ones that pave the way, that allow us to hold to a vision and a calling that is greater than ourselves, and to do so in faith and in comfort of knowing that God is always with us. And so each of these characters, they live in us. And so as we explore the Christmas story every week, I invite you to put yourself in the place of each character. I invite you to look for that character within you, the Mary within you, the Joseph within you, the wise men and the shepherds, and even the angels that come through you when you are a messenger of God. When you hold the story in this way, and this is what we do in unity, we hold it in a metaphysical way, meaning we hold the story symbolically, not so much literally. But when we hold it this way, we find that there's a richness there that is relevant today. And it is so much more than just the telling of the tale. It comes alive in us. And that, indeed, is its spiritual purpose in our hearts. So with that being said, I want to go forward and move into this week, the Advent week, the week of faith. Now, faith. What is faith? Faith is something we can't touch. And it's certainly something that we can't get from somebody. I can't go and borrow a cup of faith from Matt. Right? And I can't even give it away. I can't say, here, Michael, I'm throwing you some faith. Although I think he'd catch it if I tried. Faith lives within us. It is the foundational power that is God-given within us. And through faith, all things are indeed possible. I love thinking about faith because I believe that it is through faith that we can honestly and authentically live and move and have our very being in God. When I just have faith in myself, that wavers. And it's conditional. It depends. But when I have faith based and grounded in God, I see and know things that would never be possible from my human mind. 
And this is what we are all called to do and be. We are called to live in the power and the very essence of faith. Because in faith, we intuitively know. We know beyond knowing that God's goodness will always be. Let me say that again. I really want you to hear that. That when we live in faith, we intuitively know beyond knowing that God's goodness is always with us. It's not an easy thing, is it? It's not an easy thing at all. I mean, there are a lot of times as human beings when we struggle and we are challenged. And this world, it just... It, it feels too big. It feels like it's too much. And sometimes we just can't see beyond what's right in front of us. And even that is too much. But when we draw on faith from within us, we find a way to believe, to know beyond knowing that in those times we will heal. We will rise again. We will find a way. And that is indeed the power of faith. It is no small thing. Each of us here is on a soul journey. And our journeys are filled with lots of opportunities to live in faith. But we find that when we live in faith, when we draw up that power, that foundational power within us, there isn't a thing we can't bear. There isn't a thing we can't go through. There isn't a thing that can happen to us or through us in which God is not there. And as we know that truth, we then have what people call an unshakable faith. I used to think I had an unshakable faith. In fact, I was really proud. I think I was about eight, nine years into unity, and my faith is unshakable. Yep. You know, I've been through some things. I don't know why I put on an accent. But anyway, my faith <laughs> is unshakable. And I can go through anything. I can go through anything. And it was because I'd gone through some challenges and I had overcome. And I held a vision. And in those nights when I couldn't stand, I called on the power of God. And it was not me. But it was the power of God that caused me to rise. And so there I was, eight, nine years into unity. My faith is unshakable. Well, you know what happened? And I don't think it was bad karma, but life happened, and some hard things happened. And so I no longer say, my faith is unshakable, just in case someone's listening. I no longer say that. But what I do say, is I live and I move and I have my being in God. And that is faith. That is faith. And so that's what we are called to do. And that is what Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, is talking about when he says this. He says, faith is the perceiving power of mind. Let's start with that. Faith is the perceiving power of mind. So it's that part of us that perceives, that senses, that feels, that kind of knows, because it's not tangible. And it is linked with the power to shape substance. So whatever I have faith in is what is manifest. Did you ever wake up saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a lousy day today? And magically, what happened? <laughs> You were always disappointed, things didn't go right, you didn't feel good, and so on and so forth, right? 
You created it through your faith that you would have a lousy day. So the perceiving power of mind, what do I know? What do I believe in my mind? And as I hold that belief, I then, through the faith in that belief, have the power to create, to shape substance, to see how things show up, how they manifest. And so when we get that whatever we have faith in is what we create in our reality, we also get that it's up to us to create a life and have faith that God is always with us. And how does that show up differently than when I wake up going, I wonder what's going to happen today. When I wake up with the faith that God is in all I am, and in all I experience. And I call forward God, even if I'm not feeling it in the moment, but if I call forward God, my day will be God-blessed. And we have the power to do that. Charles Fillmore also says this. He says, my faith grows greater day by day because... Because it is planted in truth. And what is that truth? The truth is that God is always with us. That God is always good. And as we live in that, we can move the mountains that our young Klein girl spoke of, that Gina spoke of, that the family spoke of again and again. We can feel God's presence in and through everything. And so I invite you <clears throat> to think about faith in this way. And in Scripture, we find this very well-known verse, and it tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. And so when I open to the assurance of things hoped for, when I hold it in faith, and then I add to it the conviction, the belief that it will be, what happens is I create a new life and I'm transformed. And Mary, the young woman chosen to be the mother of Jesus, did just that. You know, in many Christian traditions, Mary is highly esteemed as a saint. And for good reason, because she was indeed quite remarkable. She was a young girl that was born to elderly parents. She was raised in the Jewish temple from the time she was just three years old, a little three-year-old, up until she was about 15. And at that time, she got engaged to Joseph. And she was also someone who had a very strong heart and mind that was based on the mystical and based on God. Her, she was greatly, deeply devoted to God. Now, in Scripture, we also hear that she was a virgin. And what that means is, is it, it really speaks to her age, that she was young. So she was young. And in unity, we translate virgin to mean pure in spirit. And so we see Mary as being young and pure in spirit. And we read about her in the Gospel of Luke, which I'd like to read from the first chapter. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, and he sent her to a virgin pledged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Well, Mary, she was greatly troubled at these words, and she wondered what kind of greeting might this be. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, and he will be great 
and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Well, how will this be, asked Mary, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is going to be now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary waited a moment, and then she answered, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. I am a servant of God. May it be to me as you have said. That is faith in a great in a great example. That is faith. Because we know that as Mary took on this experience from the messenger of God, she heard this message, you're the one. A lot of things had to happen for her. First of all, she had to believe that she was worthy enough to carry this child that the Jewish people had been waiting for forever. She had to believe that she was good enough. And then she had to believe that it would happen, that as it was told to her, that she could actually carry a child. And then she had to think about what it would mean to be a young girl who is carrying a child in her culture, in her time, meaning she would be an outcast, judged and criticized. And surely she had to think about the embarrassment it would bring her parents. What would it do? Would it cast shame upon them in their culture and in their family and in their faith? And then, of course, there was Joseph. He was her newly betrothed. How was he going to believe that she was suddenly pregnant and that she was carrying a child that was going to be the Messiah and that an angel came to her? And, of course, this happened, right? Of course it happened. All of this was alive in Mary, and that is why we see her draw up in faith, believing that it is so, and answering out of the love she had for God. And she said, here I am. I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be so, as you have said. Let it be so. I wonder about that. I wonder about how we would respond when we are called up to act in faith. What do we do when we have a situation? Perhaps it's not something like this, but perhaps there is something that we need to birth that feels so impossible, that seems so outrageous. But do we have the faith to believe that it's possible? Do we have the faith when, when we hear that little voice of God within that says, yes, this is possible. You are called to do great things, to overcome. Do we have the faith to know that through God all things are possible? When we are dealing with addictions, when we are dealing with children that are wayward and living lives that seem out of control and scare us to death. 
when we are dealing with issues that scare us or that are violent. When we are dealing with illness that feels unbelievably overwhelming. When we are afraid of how we will make ends meet and go forward in prosperity. And when we look out there in the world, can we believe that peace, that love is possible and that we make a difference? These are great questions of faith. And for us, they are no different than doing what Mary did. She birthed a greater reality. And we all, in these ways and more, are called to birth a greater reality. You know, I love what Mary says later in the same chapter. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. magnifies the Lord. And because my soul magnifies all that God is, I can do all things and be all things and open in my mind and in faith to all things. And that's what each of us are called to do as well. With whatever it is we are meant to birth. Now Mary went through her time of pregnancy. She lived for three months with Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with child. But during those three months, she was not truly with Joseph. And so we can only imagine what she felt and what she thought. And we know that life wasn't easy for her. And we can only imagine what her parents felt or understood. But she held to the vision of what she knew was possible and what she knew she was called to do. And eventually, she joined back with Joseph, Joseph and they journeyed to Bethlehem. And Jesus was born. I have three questions for you as we close the story of Mary today. I ask you, if you are aware of how you are called to live in faith during this Christmas season. What is it that calls you to rise up, to rise higher? How are you called to stretch yourself in faith? And once you know what that is, are you willing to believe in the goodness of God, that it will be there for you, caring you, holding you, sustaining you all the way, no matter how things look on the outside? And are you willing, during the time of process, during the time when we are waiting for that outpicturing, are you willing to allow it to be that your soul will magnify the Lord God of your being? Will you express that rather than your fear, your anxiety, your doubt? Will you express the beauty of God that lives in your soul through it out until that good unfolds? And will you lastly, will you take the action that is required to truly live in faith so that you aren't waiting passively for something magical to happen and then you say, see, there it is. But are you like Mary? And are you willing to do your part to live in faith, to know God more? These are the questions that are before us in this Christmas season. And if we answer yes, surely we will know the truth that faith lives in us and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, Christmas lives deeply and abidingly in our souls.
Thank you, and Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.